Well, good morning and welcome to Cross Community Church. I want to welcome those of you who are home and watching online, those of you at our Ficola campus, and certainly uh, those of you who are here with us as well. I want to begin this morning by sharing with you a parable that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 24. It was a parable about a party, a festive occasion. It was a parable of a banquet that was going to be thrown. It was going to be a time of celebration, a time of feasting, a time of joy. It was a wedding banquet that was going to be thrown. And so the master of the the banquet, the uh, uh, supposed father of the bride or the groom, sends out the invitations and he invites all of the friends and the family to come and enjoy uh, the party, the, the celebration that was to come. And when the feast got ready, the food was prepared, the time came for the wedding to happen, the master says to his servant, Go and, go and tell everybody, like, it's ready. Go invite them to come into my house. They get to celebrate and enjoy with us. And the, as Jesus tells the story, it goes on that one by one, the people there, they made excuses. The people who had been invited, one said, well, hey, I've got to tend to my farm. I've, I've got some business going on here. And so uh, maybe, maybe next time, maybe, I don't know, sometime later, but I, I can't come today. And another excuse came in. Well, I've I've got some some things going, and so I won't be able to make it one by one by one. They made excuses for why they couldn't enter into the joy, come to the celebration, enjoy the party. In the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus has been preaching to us, this has been an invitation to us to come and enter into the Father's joy. The New Testament describes it as the abundant life. It is the one life that is real and true. And just like the people in the story, the parable that Jesus told, if we're not careful, we will get wrapped up in the day-to-day affairs of this life and not end up enjoying or entering into the Father's joy. We won't enter into the abundant life. We'll be busy. We'll be going about our business, but we may actually miss out on life. Now, at this point in the sermon, Jesus has taught us what it looks like to live as a citizen of God's kingdom in this world. He's taught us what it looks like to follow Jesus, the characteristics of a disciple. Blessed are the poor in spirit, not those who think they have it together, but those who humble themselves and acknowledge their desperate need for Christ. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. Be careful that you don't hide your light or lose your saltiness. Now, it's at this point in the sermon where Jesus is now going to issue the invitation. He's going to do it four times over. But he's going to issue an invitation to enter into his kingdom, to enter into his life. I want to be really clear about something. The life that Jesus is inviting us to isn't the Greek word bios, right? Isn't that what we're all pretty concerned about over the last several months? Haven't we all been pretty stirred up about bios life? You think about like we, we kind of shut down our economy. Many of us stayed home for weeks, if not months on end. I think we shed about one third of our GDP in the last quarter. I mean, we made a lot of changes in our nation and our personal lives in order to preserve bios. We've been concerned. If you haven't been anxious about the COVID pandemic, um, man, I, I, I wish I had your blood pressure, right? I wish that I, I wasn't worried at some point or other about what's coming. I watched as it moved from China to Italy and then New York and the United States, and I couldn't help but wonder, like, what's coming? It's very natural when there is a threat, something that that could harm our bios for us to begin looking. And so our entire country, country has adopted all sorts of measures in order pr- to protect us from this virus that could affect our bios, our lives. And while I want to encourage you to do that, like, Please, like, take responsibility for yourself. Take all the necessary measures that you feel to protect your bios. But Jesus would say to us, what does it profit a man to maintain a bios, really have a really good bios life, but to forfeit your soul? 
So today in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is going to issue us an invitation and a warning. And in the midst of a global pandemic, I want to encourage you to take your eyes off of your bios and instead to take a look at Zoe, the life of your soul, the life that will be enduring, the one that will live for the rest of eternity. Look what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13. Two verses a fairly simple statement that he's going to make here, but one of profound significance for you and for your children and for our neighbors and for those we're going to go to school with, for the person that sits across from you at work. It is of profound significance to us. Here's what he says. He says, Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. And the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. I want you to think about the, the pandemic. Well, many of us have had a lot of anxiety and concern um, with regard to the pandemic, I think early projections, 2 million people could die in the United States. It was a big deal. A lot of reason for concern. But when you think about, um, you know, over 300 million Americans, 2 million of them potentially perishing from a virus, it's not insignificant. I don't want to nod at that, wink at that, or not say that that's significant. But in the equation that Jesus just drew out for us, the proportions are flipped here. Did you, did you see that? Whereas in America, during our time of pandemic, the vast majority of people are going to be fine, and there's a smaller percentage that are going to be affected or even die as a result. The warning that Jesus gives says, no, 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 most people, the vast majority of people that you walk past every single day, your friends and your neighbors and your teammates and your coworkers, most of them are on this broad road that is headed toward destruction. And only a few, a very small percentage of men and of women, of the people that you rub shoulders with every single day, only a few of them have entered through this narrow gate and are walking this narrow path that leads to life. And in the same way that we've taken some measures to promote bios during this pandemic, to make sure that life is sustained, that we would say, we don't want anyone to perish, right? We should implement measures in our lives to make sure that we have indeed entered through the narrow gate that Jesus describes, and that we're walking the narrow path that ultimately leads us to life. You see, the words of Jesus should be sobering for us. We should tremble at the thought that most people aren't going to get this right. As a matter of fact, only a few are going to find this narrow gate and this narrow path that leads to life. If we've been anxious about a pandemic, we should tremble at this spiritual reality that is true for the world in which we live. But you know what my fear is? That we, as the people of God, who have the words of life in Jesus Christ, we know the way, we know the truth, we know the life, that we as the people of God, that we'll get lulled to sleep. That we'll be like the people who were invited to the wedding ceremony. And we get so busy with the affairs of our lives, the goings-on of day to day. The kids have got to go to school, and I've got to prepare for this, and I've got work that we fail to enter in to the gate ourselves. We fail to enter in to the path that would lead us to life. One of the things that this text points out for us is that the path of discipleship is costly. It's a narrow gate and a narrow path that leads 
to life. If you're on a broad way and a broad path, um, you can be a little bit like me in my driving. I don't know how you guys are. I live in eastern Oklahoma out on Morris Creek Road, and it's beautiful. And for the most part, I only stay in my lane when somebody else is coming. You know what I mean? You can kind of, you know, obviously there are potholes, so sometimes you need to swerve. But I'm looking at the mountains like, oh, there's Sugarloaf. Look at Poto Mountain. I'm looking at the scenery. There's a cat. There's something going on. And so I use the whole road. I've got a little bit of margin on either side. And as long as there's not a car coming, I'm okay. Some of us, that's how we live our lives, right? Hey, the, the road's pretty broad. There's some margin, and so I can kind of, I get to, you know, drive where I want, do many of the things I want. I get to kind of carry on life as I see fit. And Jesus issues this warning. It's like, hey, the, the road that leads to life, it's narrow. It's treacherous. I don't know if you've ever seen any of these videos where other countries, there's like a giant bus up in the mountains and this really narrow road and they're having to navigate and it seems like there's just a few inches on either side. I will never forget a trip in Guanare, Venezuela. We were headed up into the mountains and it was on a very narrow road with a very steep path uh, or a steep descent on one side, mountain on the other, coming around a bend. There's a bus driver and my heart pounding like, oh man, there's just not a great margin for error here. And I was young. I wasn't all that anxious, but that was straight scary, right? Jesus, it's like, hey, life's not like the big broad path that I drive when I'm heading home every day where I'm just looking at the scenery, but rather the life is found in this narrow path. It requires full attention and full care to make sure that you're walking the path that Jesus is ultimately leading your life on. There's a couple of words used here. In verse 13, when Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate, he's using the Greek word stenos. That, that word in that context, it basically means a straight or a narrow passage where there are obstacles blocking any other way, like there's a very narrow gate that we have to enter through. In verse 14, when he uses the word narrow again, he uses the Greek word thlebo. It means, it's a word they used when they would crush grapes. It means to press upon. It, it has a sense of enduring affliction and persecution, of trial, of hardship. It's a narrow and it is a difficult, it is a treacherous way. As Jesus is teaching us, hey, this is the way to life. And not just for today. It can begin today, but it spans all the way into eternity. And can I just make this statement? If you are not living the abundant life today, you should not expect to live an eternal life with Jesus in your tomorrow, right? Like Jesus is inviting us to enter the narrow gate, to walk the narrow path today. And if you're not walking the narrow path that leads to life today, you shouldn't expect it to just somehow find it in your eternity. The path that Jesus invites us to, the path of life, it is a narrow path with a narrow gate. There's a single narrow passage to get you there. And there's a narrow path that we walk in response. Again, this should trouble us for the world in which we live. I was a sophomore in college at Oklahoma State and... <sighs> I did my best to walk with Christ in the best way a college kid could, and I had some successes and failures, and, and one day, I, I, for whatever reason, I felt really compelled to go and share the gospel with my animal biology professor. I don't remember his name at this point, and of course, because I'm a college kid, I show up a little bit unprepared. You, you know, I thought, ah, I can wing it, whatever. That I was expecting, like, God to part the waters of the sea and for him to be like, tell me how to follow Jesus. But I walk into his office, and I'm awkward, and I'm nervous, and, and I begin to just ask him about faith and, and about the Lord and where he stands on things. And he begins to articulate what is a really, really common view in our culture. As a matter of fact, I just need to tell you, a huge percentage of Christians believe this to be true. The problem with this belief is that Jesus told us it wasn't true. So here's the, the belief he articulated. He said, listen, Jason, um, I hear what you're saying. 
and I, I'm fine. Like, you're a believer, and that's great that you trust in Jesus. But I see kind of all faiths kind of have the same end goal. So if you think about God is at the top of the mountain in all different faiths, it's Islam, it's Hinduism, it's Buddhism, it's Christianity, they're just different paths up to the top of the same mountain. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're probably right, Jason. I think you're wise to pursue your path. But I really think there are lots of paths that will get you to the destination that you want to get to. Double-digit percentages of Christians believe the same thing. And yet Jesus, in inviting us to life, Jesus, who saw it rightly, Jesus, who was willing to die for this, enter through the narrow gate. There's a small straight, a narrow passage that all the other ways are blocked. There's only one way to get to life. Now, we get to cheat, by the way. This is like a spoiler alert if you're just walking through Matthew's gospel. Jesus is going to go on and he's going to say, I'm the gate. Like, I, I'm the path. I'm, I'm the life. It's, it's me. Like, I'm the, the one. Like, I have come. Here, here's the thing. The, the straight or the gate is narrow, and the, the path is narrow uh, because, really, there's only one possible way to get us there. Jesus, thus far, in the Sermon on the Mount, he's been helping us to realize just how sinful we are. He begins this section with the Greek word, uh, it's ice erkomai. It means enter. It's an invitation. He says, enter through the narrow gate. This invitation should be one that you think, Jesus, I can't. In the Sermon on the Mount thus far, he says, he uses this word again, by the way. He says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so Jesus said, unless your righteousness is better than the scribes and the Pharisees, he went on to say that you should be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, but then he invited us to enter. Like, my righteousness, not better than the scribes and Pharisees. You, if you were to look at my life, you would know that I fall short of the perfection of God. And yet Jesus, he stands up on this day and teaching us about life and inviting us in. He says, yeah, go ahead and enter through this narrow gate. If you're here today and you're reading the Bible correctly, you should rightly be saying, I can't. If the righteous requirement of the law was perfection, Jesus says, like, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, every single one of us in this room, we're incapable of entering. You can't enter with even one sin. And yet if you know the story of Christ, if you read ahead in Matthew's gospel, you've been around the church for very long, you've probably heard the simple good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Jesus, who came and issued this invitation, he also came to pay the price of admission to the kingdom of God, to life for you and for me. And so there's only been one man who lived a life more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees, the life that met the standard of perfection of God, and that was Jesus. And as he came to this world, he lived his perfect life. He ultimately went to the cross for you and for me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. We see that God made him, Jesus, the one who extended the invitation, the one who paid the price of admission. God made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here, here's what happened. We couldn't enter through the gate. Man, we got this, this bag just in, like, we wouldn't fit. It just wouldn't happen. My, my dog uh, often, like, runs with me out in the pasture, and we have a barbed wire fence. And so she does really well. She can jump through that thing no problem. Uh, but there was a time when she was carrying this big stick, 
And so she goes to run through the barbed wire fence like normal, like everything should be fine, and the stick won't fit between the wires. She gets stuck. She falls down. It was entertaining for all of us. In the same way, you and I, because of our sin, we don't fit. But Jesus went to the cross to make an atoning sacrifice for your sin and for mine. And there he suffered, and he bled, and he died so that we could enter through the narrow gate. What happened there on the cross, we call it the great exchange. It's known as substitutionary atonement, where God took all of our sin. For those of us who would place our faith and trust in Jesus, he took all of our sin, sins of your past and your present and your future, and he placed them on his son Jesus, as he hung there on the cross, the weight of his body ripping at those nails that had been driven through his wrists and his ankles, God placed your sin, my sin, those of us who had come to faith in Christ, on his son Jesus, and he poured out his wrath, his just wrath against sin. He poured that out on his son, and he took that perfect life of Jesus. That perfect, sinless life. And he credited that to us. He wrapped you and I in the righteousness of Jesus so that we could enter through the gate. He took our sin so that we could enter through the gate and we could begin to live this life that is no longer broken and scarred and marred and stained by sin futile ways where we're chasing after the things of this world that are empty. But we can begin to live this life of following Jesus. Once we enter through the gate, we start this journey of following Jesus where he has lordship over our lives. Now, many of us, we kind of feel like we entered through the gate, right? We kind of feel like, yeah, I entered through the gate. Uh, I remember a time. This is what uh, Southeastern Oklahoma religion, by the way, right? This is this is it. There was a time where I prayed a prayer and I walked an aisle. For many of us, praying the prayer was the price of admission, right? I prayed the prayer to Jesus, and that means I got through the gate. That was my price of admission. And then I, walking the aisle was like the path to life, right? That's what we thought it was. Like I prayed a prayer, I walked an aisle, I'm good, right? The problem with that is that if our hearts weren't genuinely filled with faith, praying a prayer and walking an aisle might burn a few calories, but it doesn't change anything in our hearts. Jesus is going to continue to remind us in this section of Scripture, in the Sermon on the Mount. He would remind us and point us to look at the fruit of our lives. Has your heart been changed? Do y'all remember uh, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Anybody? Will Smith? Um, He lived in West Philadelphia. That's where he was born and raised. Playground where he spent most of his days, right? So this is Will Smith who lived in Philadelphia, but he got in one little fight and his mom got scared, so he had to move with his aunt and his uncle in Bel Air, right? Y'all know the story. And so he pulls up to the house about seven or eight, yells to the cab, you go home, smell you later. Uh, I, 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 what do you say? I came to my kingdom. I was finally there to sit on my throne as the prince of Bel Air. Here's the thing um, that show was awesome and funny because you took a guy from uh, Presumably the streets of Philadelphia, and now he's living in a mansion in Bel Air, right? I mean, he gets to live with his Uncle Phil. He's got all of these great rights and things that he gets to enjoy. I mean, a mansion. They had a butler. I mean, he had quite a life to live there. Now, the show is really funny because while Will Smith thought he had come to sit on his throne as the Prince of Bel Air, he wasn't actually the king of that kingdom, Uncle Phil was the king of the kingdom, right? And every time uh, Will tried to go his way, Uncle Phil would d- redirect him, right? He'd have to point him to know, I'm the king of this kingdom. If you're going to live in my house, it's going to be this way. Many of us, we approach faith kind of like Will Smith and the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. We think, oh, yeah. Man, I got a ticket. I prayed a prayer and I walked an aisle. Now I get all the benefits of Jesus. 
Like, man, I just get to live here and do as I please and, and whatever I want. Like, man, I get to live a life. It's kind of like we had an intersection where our lives crossed path with Jesus. And we're like, hey, why don't you just come with me? Man, I'm going to keep walking the path I've been living, but I'm going to incorporate a little bit of Jesus into my life. I want you to bless me. I want you to save me. I want you to, you know, I need my business to succeed, my finances to improve. I need to be healthy. God, would you just kind of enrich every part of my life? And the problem with that sort of thinking is that we never came under the lordship of Christ. We enter through the gate with a heart of humility that sees the gap between our utter sinfulness before God and His profound and overwhelming righteousness. And we know we can't make that gap up. God is perfectly holy and just, and we are completely sinful. There's no way to enter through the gate. Unless we humble ourselves before God. We come to him in faith, recognizing that we've been walking the wrong path. The prayer we pray, it's a prayer of repentance. God, I've been walking this way. I've been walking the wrong way. I've been sinful. What I've been doing is the wrong path. It's deserving of eternity in hell. But Jesus, you came and offered a sacrifice. You came and offered your life for me. You've, you've given to me your righteousness by faith. And so, Jesus, I want to turn from this path, the one that as I look around, most people are walking, and I want to begin to walk the narrow path that leads to life. You see, Jesus gives you a gate. And listen, if you have come to faith in Jesus Christ, you need to know that you have been saved. You need to be assured of your salvation. But if you happen to look around and you aren't walking a narrow path that leads to life, if your faith costs you nothing, you're not walking in obedience to Jesus Christ, you need to question which gate you actually entered through. Jesus is extending an invitation it's an invitation to an abundant life, a life of joy and fulfillment and satisfaction. It's a life of hardship, of persecution, of trial and tribulation for the sake of the kingdom of God. So today I want to ask you a few questions with regard to your life, a few questions to evaluate which path you're traveling. Are you with the majority? Are you traveling the popular path? Does your life look like most people around you? Your lifestyle and your decisions and your priorities, are they pretty much like everyone else's or is there something unique in you that by love for God you have humbly chosen to walk a different path? Does your life look like most people? The question number two, who is leading your life? Who calls the shots? Are you consistently asking the question, what is the Word of God have, having to say about that and beginning to walk the path that leads to life? Or are you on the Broadway? There's a lot of options here. I can kind of go whichever way I want. Have you just kind of incorporated Jesus into your life to take him with you on your journey? Or have you left your life to follow him? The third question as you look at your life and you look at the struggles that you may be enduring, what's the source of your struggles? Is it that you're seeking first the kingdom of God and you're facing trials and tribulations and persecutions because you're a believer in Jesus Christ? Or as you look at your life, are you just reaping the destruction of sinful behaviors and choices? There's only two options that Jesus points us toward here. There's a wide, broad path, wide gate that leads to destruction. 
narrow gate, narrow path that leads to life. For you here today, which path are you walking? Are you following hard after Jesus? Allowing him to be the Lord of your life? Are your choices and decisions and priorities seeking first the kingdom of God? Or are you seeking first the kingdom of you? Jesus invites us to enter through the gate. He invites us to follow him to life. Today, that's my invitation to you as the church of Jesus Christ. To take a minute and to assess your life and to determine which path you're following. I, I told you that I'm not the best um, driver sometimes. I don't have a lot of wrecks, but I'm not always the most cautious and it seems since like the first day that I went anywhere with my wife and we first started dating, she's always had this response to my driving. It happens quite a lot where I'm driving down the road, taking in the scenery and just kind of enjoying whatever might be happening. I'm not the most attentive guy. I, I, confession on the front end, I'm not all that attentive, uh, attentive. So what happens ever so often is my wife... Um, she lets out this gasp. And it's not just any, it's like complete with like bracing herself on the dash. There's a foot up for protection. Like it is, death is imminent. We need to brace for like any second life is over. Like we're not going to be here anymore. And of course, like I'm, I can't look at the clouds anymore. I've got to look at the road. And I, I look up ready to respond to like whatever's coming, like a plane land. I mean, I am ready for whatever is coming only to realize that this is a little lane change. I don't have to have to hit the brakes that hard. I mean, I barely have to make an even, even an adjustment, you know? It's, she's kind of overreacting. Since our very first days, where my wife would let out the gasp and brace herself, I've gotten mad about every time she's done that, right? I mean, your adrenaline is pumping. All of a sudden, I had this blissful state. I'm staring at the clouds. Life is good. Now my heart is pounding. Adrenaline's running through my veins. And I feel like fury. I don't know what to do with what, what I feel now because my body was prepared to respond to an emergency. And, well, there wasn't an emergency, at least not in my eyes, right? Do you know what I tell her every time? I say, Please don't stop. Because it's so much better to be warned too early than to be warned too late. The very first sermon that Jesus ever preached, he went up on a mountain. He taught about life in the kingdom of God. And then he gave us this warning. Because people could so easily be lulled to sleep. He invites us to enter through the narrow gate and to walk the narrow path. And that we might start walking that path of abundant life today that's going to feed right into eternal life tomorrow. Like eternal life, it actually begins right here and right now, and we're to live as citizens of God, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, while we're still here on earth. And it may be true of us that as we begin to walk in that life, we begin to experience the abundance of Jesus, that we have to be a little bit like my wife. And rather than just rolling through life like me, kind of careless, looking out the window, we stop and we're willing to warn somebody. We're willing to point out that it looks like they're on the path to destruction. That we would articulate the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we would extend this invitation that Jesus has extended to us. That we might warn them too early, but we never want to be guilty of warning someone too late. So as salt and light here on this earth, I want to encourage you. 
Not to be judgmental. We went over that before, right? Not to look down on everybody and point out every flaw, but to point people to him who is the way and the truth and the life. To point people to Jesus, the hope of the world. So today, we're going to have a time of invitation. I'm going to pray in just a minute. And during this time of invitation, I'm going to ask you to think about your life. Has your faith required anything of you? Has it been costly? Have you entered into Jesus Christ through faith in him and humbly submitted to him as the king of your life where he's the one that now guides your decisions and your priorities, where you're submitting yourself to him in the word? Or could it be true that you just prayed a prayer and and walked an aisle and you've actually placed your faith and trust in those acts and not in the person of Jesus? That if you look at your life, you're actually kind of on the broad path that it seems like everyone else is walking down. You hear the warning of Jesus for you today and seriously evaluate where you are. But the second thing I want you to pray about during this time of response are those people around you that you love, that you care about, that you see, you wave out every morning in the driveway, that you work next to in your office. And would you have the guts to be like my wife, stomping the imaginary, imaginary brake pedal, that you would be willing to say, hey, can I tell you about Jesus? Can I tell you about the, the one who changed my life? Can I tell you where I found new life in Jesus, where I've had my sins forgiven? And you just take the time to articulate the gospel of Jesus Christ. It may be kind of clunky and ugly, kind of like my animal biology professor who did not trust Christ in that moment. I don't know if he ever did. But would you be willing to be a little bit undignified, to be a little bit awkward, and to take that moment to share and to point people to the gate and to the path of life? Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for your warnings that you would give to us And Father, we thank you for life that's available in you. Lord, that there was a standard that we couldn't meet that you met for us. You gave the invitation and then you paid the price of admission that we might begin to walk a path that leads to life. That even in this world where we're still going to suffer, we may be persecuted, we may endure difficulty. Father, we can live a life of abundance in you. And God, I pray that we wouldn't fall short of that. That as Cross Community Church, we could be light in the darkness of this world. That we would be salt while we're here. That we would stand out and bring good and light to our culture. For the man or the woman in this room, who maybe follows Eastern Oklahoma religion, but has never bowed their knee to you, trusted in you fully, begin to follow you on the path of life. I pray that today would be the day of salvation. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.